So, so the question, guys, we, the question is really why Milton? Why should we study Milton? In some class, in some courses in other universities, there will be a mandatory course on Shakespeare. And very rarely is there a mandatory course on Milton. Here at least you have to read Paradise Lost. But in some universities, you can get an undergraduate education and even be an English major and not read Milton. I think the argument can be made that, that Milton is a more important poet than Shakespeare. I mean, Shakespeare is a kind of cottage industry of himself. And sure, he had influence on later poets, that's obvious. But Milton is the poet with which everyone had to reckon. Milton came after Shakespeare. And if you were a poet writing after Shakespeare, what would you feel in relationship to your predecessor? predecessor? Y y well, you'd feel anxiety. And Milton felt that anxiety. And one of the things he did in his poetic career was work out that anxiety in relationship to Shakespeare. Mil Shakespeare died in 16, did we say 1621? Milton was born in 1608. But Milton, in order to become himself, had to deal with Shakespeare, and we'll talk about that. But anybody writing after Milton had to deal with Milton. In the 18th century, people virtually couldn't write because of Milton. That Milton had to be repressed. That in order for, for Augustines like Pope and Dryden and others to write, Milton had to be pushed aside. It wasn't until the Romantics that Milton is again celebrated. And he becomes obviously influential in, the Rom in, in Wordsworth, in Coleridge, in Blake. How do we see um, Blake's influence by Milton? He writes a poem called Milton, right? Thomas de Quincey found himself moved upon reading Paradise, Paradise Lost, a step upwards ascending as upon Jacob's ladder from earth to mysterious altitudes above the earth. Ralph Waldo Emerson found in Amer Milton a kindred spirit, not only a great poet, but the towering figure who with his power to inspire had an influence purely spiritual. Coleridge found Milton's egotism to be a revelation of spirit. Now after the 19th century, T.S. Eliot had enough of the Romantics and also enough of Milton. So Milton really became repressed. Every, Milton is a lightning rod. Milton becomes a lightning rod for who you are as a poet. And then the whole question of, well, who is this Milton? Is he a radical? Is he a revolutionary? We know that he participated in the execution of the king. He argued for it in 1649, King Charles. Is he a regicide? Or is he the figure who Coleridge and de Quincey speak about as this spiritual figure? Now, Milton had this contested legacy. And people will still argue, is Milton a heretic? Or is Milton an Orthodox Christian? Blake had his own opinion on the matter. There's some images of Paradise Lost. I love, I love this particular image, the kind of somber face of Milton looking out from the darkness. This is from already a 1695 edition of Paradise Lost. And you can even just see from the frontispiece that there's already an attempt to turn Milton into a classic poet. This is a poem that's comparing Milton with Virgil and Homer, with Virgil and Homer saying he's superior to both Virgil and Homer. And we see this kind of classical, um, this ca classical frame. Uh, those who were trying to turn Milton into a classic poet had to contend with his reputation as a regicide. And there were these two parts of Milton. Now Blake, going back to Blake, said the reason Milton wrote in fetters, what are fetters? He wrote how we, chains. When he wrote of angels and God and at liberty one of devils in hell is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. So Blake says famously that Milton was of the devil's party without knowing it. And again, that debate, Milton as heretic, Milton as of the devil's party, or Milton writing this orthodox Christian poem that's starting at the end of the 17th century could be read with the King James Bible when you came from, home from church, or in the 18th century would be read as Sunday afternoon reading with Robinson, Robinson Crusoe by Defoe, or again with the King James Bible. So Milton occupies this very strange place. Philip Pullman, you know him? He, there was a movie that was just 
based upon his, his book called Dark Materials or Dark Matter. He wrote, Milton is of the devil's party and does know it. So one of the questions we'll be asking, is Milton of the devil's party or not? Again, there's this sense of the enormous influence of Milton. Harold Bloom writes of the anxiety of influence. I think we spoke about Bloom's critical concept. The anxiety of influence is, is that some poets are so strong in Bloom's terms that they make it very difficult for poets to go on. I mean, Homer is a poet like that. He, he, what he does is so great that one wonders, well, how do, you, how do you continue? So you become Sophocles, you become Aeschylus. You find some way of incorporating what Homer does so you can go into the future. Who is another strong poet in our, we, we mentioned it already, in, our, in, in, in the period we're referring to? Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the strong poet from which Milton has to recover. But everyone has to recover from Milton. He is such a strong poet that, again, he makes poetry impossible or seemingly impossible for a century. And then every poet after that century among the Romantics is in some sense indebted to Milton. I love this pair of quotations from Keats. Keats says, I've lately stood, guard, stood my guard against Milton. Life to him would be death to me. I have lately stood my guard against Milton. Life to him would be death to me. What does he mean? Meaning if, 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 Milton, if Milton continues as a poetic influence, then there's no possibility for Keats to write. But on the other hand, Milton, uh, Keats writes in a poem a pro interestingly entitled, one wonders what Milton would think of this title, Lines on Seeing a Lock of Milton's Hair. So Keats is according Milton this iconic status. We know how Milton feels about icons and idolatry. Milton himself is being turned into an icon. Chief of organic numbers, old scholar of the spheres, thy spirit never slumbers but rolls about our ears forever and ever. So which Keats is this? I mean, is it the Keats who can't deal with the possibility of Milton? Or the Keats who hears Milton's poetic voice, a voice that obviously informs Keats's own voice? So it really should be argued that we should be spending a semester on Shakespeare and a semester as well on Milton because Milton's poetic influence is so powerful and we can hear his voice not only in later English poetry or the repression of his voice but also in American poetry. And in a, in some poets have said that Milton is the first American. If it's not Milton who is the first American voice, it's really Milton Satan. Because the satanic voice, as we'll see, informs a voice of individualism, of rebellion, of liberty. So as an introduction to Paradise Lost, I, I want to look at, at, let's say, four frames before we even get started. And we'll start by looking at the invocation to Paradise Lost. The first frame is the frame of classicism versus Puritanism. Now, we've seen the tensions between the classical and the Puritan, or what we would call, and Milton comes at the end of our period, between Renaissance and Reformation. Renaissance is a period of going back to a classical past Man is the measure of all things. An iconographic condition, tradition. Man is maker of images. A man-centered tradition. A humanist tradition. On the other hand, our period is a period of reformation. Puritanism. A God-centered universe. An iconoclastic tradition, if one can use such a phrase. Milton comes at the end of this period and manifests or is the apotheosis of both of those traditions. Milton is the great Reformation poet and the great Puritan poet. I mean, saying that Milton is a Puritan poet is, is almost like an oxymoron. Why? Because Puritans should be iconoclasts. But Milton is the great iconoclast and the great image maker. We know in one of the books that I refer to often, Milton at St. Paul's School, when Milton was in high school, when John Donne was the dean of the school, the dean of St. Paul's. The book This Thick details what Milton learned, and, and I'm still catching up with what Milton knew in you know, eighth grade. But he not only was proficient, as we know, in the classical tradition, but also he was reading and versed 
in all of Puritan, in Protestant and Puritan theology. We know the earlier parts of his life were spent as a Protestant polemicist. So how do we explain Paradise Lost? Can we talk about a Puritan poet? Do we want to say that Milton is a schizophrenic? I mean, we spoke about the difference between Jack Dunn and the Dean of St. Paul's, John, John Dunn, and worried about the relationship one to the other. With Milton, that question becomes even more urgent. How do we relate these two very different traditions and these two very different voices? So when looking at Paradise Lost, we'll think about the ways in which Milton deals with these two traditions. How does he affiliate himself? Does he affiliate himself more to a Christian tradition or a classical tradition? Does he affiliate himself more to a Christian tradition or to a Hebraic tradition? I mean, we'll, come to that, we'll come to that again in, in a moment. So that's really one frame that we'll look at. The other is, or another, the second one is the problem of evil. And we'll, this will, in this sense, we'll be looking at Paradise Lost as a theodicy. What are some of the other theodicies we've looked at? So the Odyssey really initiates a tradition of theodicy. The Oresteia is another in that tradition. In the Hebraic tradition, what is the, the paradigmatic theodicy? <coughs> Obviously Job. So we'll be, looking at, we'll be looking at Paradise Lost also as a theodicy. What is the job that a th the theodicy has to do? What is a theodicy generically? How would we define it? I mean, I, I think, I, if, yeah? So it brings up the question of good and evil. Well, we, we might ask, well, why does, that, why does that question of evil have to be asked? I mean, you might find on Wikipedia, I, I wonder if this is the case, but the dic dictionary definitions of theodicy often borrow from Milton to justify the ways of God to man. So the question is, well, why do God's ways need to be justified? Why do they need to be justified? To better understand God. So the reason I need to justify the ways of God to man is because I want to better understand this, like this kind of cognitive, theoretical, idealist activity. Justification sounds stronger than that, doesn't it? Yeah. I think they, they feel like they need to explain it because they feel like it's not justice, like it's injustice. Uh, so what leads to the experience of injustice? Ah, uh, bad things happen to good people. Right? And another, we could add to the list of theodicies. We would have to put in parentheses, impoverished theodicies, um, Harold Kushner's, why bad things happen to good people. Justifying God's ways to man. What ways need to be justified? Bad things happen. Like what? My 12-year-old comes to me. Ow, I have a hangnail. Why does that happen? Why, it's a, that is a question of theodicy. It really is. Why am I suffering? The question of suffering is the question of theodicy. The question really, why is there evil in the world? So I, there, there are a couple of like, let's, let's pretend we're, we're theologians. Let's put on our theological thinking caps for the moment. And just think about like, what are, what are some of the, the, the one foot, and let's stress one foot answers to the problem of evil. I realize that many of you have solved this problem at your Shabbos table, right, after the cholent. And no, no offense, but theologians for the past 2,000 years have been thinking about this question. And, you know, it's not that your potato kugel was so good that it made you, gave you the answer that Thomas Aquinas couldn't think of, right? So what, but let's just, let's just map out the alternatives. Thomas Aquinas eating potato kugel. That's an idea, right? That's an idea. Um, um, or your shami kogel even better. Are you, are you Googling that, Lizzie? Is that on? Anyway, so let's not get too distracted. So um, what are the possibilities for theodicy? I mean, what are the possible ways of, of solving so things? Without evil, then you can't appreciate good. Uh, uh, well, OK. I mean, no, but I, my problem is there's evil in the world. I mean, even before that question. Where does evil come from? I mean, I, my assumptions are, from the Hebraic tradition, that God is all-knowing, all-good, and all-powerful. So those are, we have to, we have to, those, those are the axioms. So by default, it would come from us. Oh, oh well, see, I, this is Shabbos table talk first, right? I need to know, what is the source of evil? So one possibility is, since God is all-good, then I'll have to posit an alternative source of evil. And, and that's what Augustine was arguing with Manichaeans, and Manichaeans, to get out of this problem, argued for a divine source of good and a divine source of evil. That's a good answer. 
right? Meaning, we don't want to impugn God's all goodness, so we'll just create an alternate source of evil. But what have we impugned along the way? Uh, God's all powerful. So we'll say that God is all powerful, and there's not an independent source of evil, but what have we done on the way? We've impugned God's all goodness. Meaning, because now God himself, Milton calls him the author of all things, is also the author of evil. So either way we go, we're going to have problems. I realize that you guys may have thought of ways in, in, in our own Jewish tradition, there are Maimonidean and other ways of thinking about this, but let's just, let's just keep our theological horizons clear and open. That's the problem of theodicy that Milton is going to have to deal with. But we'll come back to that, this problem of theodicy. That's another frame for thinking about Paradise Lost, the problem of evil. Then there's the question of time. Tell me what you think about time, and I'll tell you what you believe. Milton, in his Paradise Lost, is obsessed with time. Conceptions of time, of how you think about time, are really intrinsic to how we think about the world. Passage from Augustine kind of gets at the two notions of time, let's call them two for the moment, that are implicit in Paradise Lost. Augustine writes, who can deny that things to come are not yet? Sometimes you just want to say to these philosophers like Plato and Aristotle and Augustine like, duh, right? Who can deny that things to come are not yet? That makes sense, right? Yet, already there is in mind an expectation of things to come. Where is there a shift? Obviously, with the yet. What's the first vision of time? If I had to render that graphically, how would I render it? It's linear. Time is an arrow. And on that arrow, I'm at this point. And where is the future? At this point. And it being at this point, I don't know what's happening here. If, if, I, if I did, among other things, I could be very wealthy. Will Microsoft trade up tomorrow morning on the New York Stock Exchange or not? If I were here, I would know, but I'm not. I'm on, I'm on this part of this line. Time is linear. Who can deny that things to come are not yet? Yet already, Augustine says, there is in mind an expectation of things to come. What kind of time, notion of time is that? How do I know what's going to be? How do I have, as a literary critic calls it, a sense of an ending? How do I know about this sense of an ending? Experience. Experience. That may become in handy. I'm not so sure. Is that, where, is, that where I, is that where I know from a Christian tradition, from a Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition? How do I know? I think I may have asked you, what sound does a clock make? Tick, tick tock. Excellent. <laughs> have we covered that already in class? So s clocks used to sound like that. They used to sound like tick tock. So how many parts are there in this mechanism? Dos. So our photographer, our cameraman says there are, in another language, there are two. Would anybody want to cons contest two? There's the, I forget what the term is, but there's a space in between. Ah, there's the, there in between the tick and the talk, there is the, inter there is the interval, or the duration <laughs> in between. There's the tick and the talk. Once the tick happens, what do I know will follow? I mean, as Leela says, there is an interval. But the tick comes, I know there's going to be a talk. That is also a literary structure. That is also the structure of history. Tick, talk. What's the tick in Judeo-Christian history? What's the creation? Bereshit bara Elohim. The beginning. In the beginning. What's the talk? Revelation. <laughs> so really, depending upon where you situate yourself, <laughs> Revelation, Gula, however you want to define that. In the Christian tradition, Revelations. You're leaving a big space. Uh, so there's a big space between the tick and the talk. 
that interval is that space and time that Augustine refers to in the first sentence. Who can deny that things to come are not yet? I have two versions of how I experience the world. One is experiential. Things happen, one thing after another after another, yet I have a sense of an ending. I have a sense of an ending. Where do I get that from? I get that from revelation. I know that from God revealing himself. Bereshit bar Elohim, that's the beginning. He also fore foresees the end. As you guys are already intimating, and this is really a Miltonic point, so we'll take a Maimonidean um, digression. What is the Maimonidean principle of faith about Mashiach, about the Messiah? Somebody help me out here. Ani mamin, b'amun ha-shlema, b'abiyat ha-mashiach, v'af al hit mamea, and even though he tarries, in kol zeh, ani mechakelo, b'chol yom. It's gorgeous, isn't it? I believe with all my faith in the coming of the Mashiach, and even though he tarries, with all this. What is the antecedent of this? Interval. The antecedent of this is that interval. What is really the this? Life. The suffering, right? With all this, with all this waiting, I wait for him every day. So the two parts of the Augustan notions of time, we're really doing Torah Romata here, the two notions of the Augustan parts of time, the first is duration. I don't know what's going to happen. We all live in that world. I don't want to know what's going to happen. Yet, says Augustine, already there is in mind an expectation of things to come. These two conceptions of time. Now, Thomas Brown, who is the weirdest person in the 17th century, which is saying a lot, writes as following, which gives you a sense of how he's kind of mixing this these senses of time up. Before Abraham was, I am, is the saying of Christ. Yet, is it, is, is it true in some sense if I say it of myself. For I was not only before myself, but Adam, that is in the idea of God, and the decree of that synod from all eternity. And in this sense, I say, the world was before the creation, and at an end before it had a beginning, and thus was I dead before I was alive. Though my grave be England, my dying place was paradise, and Eve miscarried of me before she conceived of Cain. So on the one hand, you want to say, let's get the straitjacket for old Sir Thomas Brown here, right? But on the other hand, he's just importing this second notion of time and mixing up temporality so his own personal life is so integrated with this life where the tick and the talk are already known, beginning and ends. So we'll see this two, the one frame again that we'll be looking at in relationship to Paradise Lost is what are the notions of time? Does Milton have more than one? How does he switch between these notions that we'll see in Augustine? Oops. What's number four? Christian Midrash. I hope people are not horrified. Is this heretical? Is anybody going to write a letter to their parents? Christian Midrash? How is that possible? Somebody said that Paradise Lost is a t retelling of a conventional story. I think, I think, Lizzie, that's an understatement, right? It's not only a conventional story, it's a story of divine origin. We said that Milton is a strong poet. We might also say that Mil Milton is the most chutzpah of poets. It's, it takes a lot of chutzpah to do this. This is a story that has a good provenance, right? You're, you're making it into a movie? Milton, it's been done, right? When Milton comes to you with his idea for Paradise Lost, he had like 40 ideas for epics. And he says, I'm going to redo the story of Adam and Eve. What do you tell him? Uh, I don't think so, right? I mean, it's already been done. But Milton is doing more with the story. And in a way, the reason Midrash is a very useful category in talking about Paradise Lost is because Milton is functioning as a kind of Midrashist. Well, first of all, what does Midrash do? How does it function? Why, 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 do we, why is there such a category as Midrash? Why do Chazal, why do the Jewish sages have any, why is, where is, the, why is there in the need for Midrash? Yeah, Lizzie. It, comes, it takes like the conventional story and puts yeah. this on the goal to Jesus. Uh, so, so it's an interpretive, I, I think that's nice that Midrashim aren't, I, I really like using the idea of Midrashim as interpretive stories. And you're emphasizing the ethical. But wh why do I, where do I get these stories from? Where is there the license to add like this? Yes, Malcolm. Where, where something is not clear, I have to explain 
Ah, now a, a critic of the last century, Eric Auerbach, writes about the difference between a Greek and Hebraic tradition. The Greek tradition, he says, is characterized by something called hypotaxis, H-Y-P-O-T-A-X-I-S, hypotaxis, which is subordination, where every, the relationship between one thing and another is very clear. The Hebraic tradition, he says, is characterized by parataxis. We have a board. Parataxis and hypotaxis. Parataxis is more a tradition of the juxtaposition of stories, where sometimes the connections are not clear. In the Greek tradition, the connections, Auerbach says, are always articulated. Auerbach, may, his terms may be polemical, may be overstated, but they're useful. Parataxis is the joining together of events without those connections articulated. Now, we know that Abraham was the first Jew and that he rejected idolatry. Where do we know about Abraham in the shop? And his, a midrashim. How do the midrashim, how, how do the sages have a license to do that? There are gaps in the story. There are what we would call lacunae, openings. And they use those openings to fill them. They fill up those, those gaps. So we have a midrashic tradition. Now, Milton is coming to Paradise Lost, which is at the beginning of what book? How would he name it? The Old Testament. And the Old Testament may be, for his Christian purposes, laden with meanings which are either problematic to him or not useful to him. So we will find Milton using, interestingly, the, the method of Midrash in order to tell a Christian story. That is, he will fill in the gaps of the Old Testament story in a way to make that story more Christian. Now, Milton is... <laughs> is complex because many of, the Midra many of the stories that he tells in Book 4 of Paradise Lost, in Book 9 of Paradise Lost, in Book 7 of Paradise Lost, about the creation of Adam and Eve, are actual Midrashim. That he had, it's unclear what his fluency in Hebrew was, but the Perky de Rebbe Eliezer were translated into Latin in 1643 and 1644. So he had them. So he knew Jewish Midrash. So Milton is simultaneously using Jewish Midrash, but more importantly, I'm saying, is he's using Midrashic method. Midrashic method is finding gaps and filling them in. And filling them in in such a way to take what is a Jewish story, again, laden with particular me meanings, with resonances, and Christianizing it. Other figures, Augustine among them, would allegorically reinterpret aspects of the Old Testament. Milton is going a step further. He's rewriting it. <laughs> it's chutzpah, right? It's amazing chutzpah. So these are the four categories that are really useful for an introduction to Paradise Lost. Let's see how they play out, if they do, in the first 27 lines, the invocation to Paradise Lost. Everybody's got a text. If not, we have it in front of us. Let's, let's just read the whole thing, and then we'll, then we'll go back and, and look at it carefully, okay? Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain, regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret hop top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning. The most chutzpahdic line in English poetry, right? In the beginning, right? Aren't you borrowing something, Milton? How the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. That's chutzpah. Or of Zion Hill, delight thee more in Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God. I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song. That with no middle flight intends to soar above the Ionian mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me. For thou knowest, thou from the first was present and with mighty wings outspread dove-like sats brooding on the vast abyss and made it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine what is low, raise and support that to the height of this great argument 
I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. I thought I was channeling Kenneth Branagh there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, no? So let's, let's, let's look at this passage, and maybe in light of some of the things that we've, we've already looked at or we've already mentioned. Um, of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden. What does Paradise Lost begin with? Lost of paradise. Sin. So it, well, transgression. A recap. Tra I mean, we know the story, yes. Transgression followed by mortality, death, loss, woe. Paradise loss begins with transgression, loss, death, and suffering. That is, thinking in Augustan terms, we begin in that first conception of time. The interval between the tick and the talk. The interval between the tick and the talk is characterized by death, loss, and suffering. But in Milton, as in Augustan, there is at the very beginning of the poem, and we wonder, and we'll ask this, why does Milton need to go on? At the very beginning of the poem, we have a sense of an ending. Till one greater man restore us. Who is that one greater man? So he's already invoking the ending. First five lines of Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. Suffering, loss, death. The sense of an ending. Redemption. Again, we have to ask the question, why does Milton go on? The poem ends here. I know everything now. Why do I need to continue? Till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse. We asked before, what are Milton's affiliations? How does he affiliate himself? Sing, heavenly muse. What is he signaling? What is he screaming out? Homer, Virgil. We're educated people at Bar-Yalan. We know, right? Sing Heavenly Muse. It's a no-brainer. The invocation is a signal generically that Milton is affiliating himself with an older Greek and Latin tradition. But we'll wonder how he makes it more complicated. Sing Heavenly Muse that on the secret top, interestingly secret, of Oreb or of Sinai. What's Oreb? No, no clue. No clue what Oreb is. Should we pronounce it differently? Chorev, people. Chorev, right? Oreb. Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd. We'll come back to that shepherd. Who is the shepherd here, by the way? Moses. Moses. So in its simple meaning, it's Moses. But let's keep that in mind. Who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or, if sea on hill delight thee more, and see Lewis brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song. Where is sea on hill? That's another place. Have we heard of that before? I think if you go down, the, go to Kfish Gea and you wait outside and you get on the 400 bus, you'll eventually get there, right? Hartzion. So Milton is associating himself, I mean, it's interesting. I'm confused now, right? Sing Heavenly Muse. What, are the what is the affiliation here? Sing Heavenly Muse is Homer. Greek and Zion Hill is Hebraic. And the mention of the oracle, where do I find oracles? Yeah. Not in Bereshit, no. not in Genesis in a Greek context. So Milton is simultaneously as affiliating himself with a Hebraic and a Greek tradition. Remember, we said there's this kind of tension between classicism and Protestantism. Classicism and Christianity. And Milton is forcing it at the very beginning of the poem. I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Ionian mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. Why, why with no middle flight? Why above the Ionian mount? Is he, is he flying jet blue? Why is he above these mountains? Why above the Ionian mount? Whatever the Greeks represent, whatever traditions they represent, he's going to outdo them. He's going to fly over them. Attempt things yet unattempted in prose or rhyme. Again, talk about chutzpah. Milton is announcing, I'm going to do something that is utterly different than anybody before. I mean, interesting that he does this in the context of affiliating himself with 
the two major traditions in the West, or the two cities in the West, Athens and Jerusalem. Both of them are invoked. At the very same time that they're invoked, he says, I'm going to overdo it, over, overgo them. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that does prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me. And we notice Milton's very Protestant gesture. We've seen things like this in Herbert. What is, the Jews had their external temples. What is primary for the Christians? The heart. And we spoke about the Reformation as this time of individuation, of interiority. And here we see Milton asserting that sense of Protestant or Puritan interiority, the heart being preferred to the temples. Instruct me for thou knowest, thou from the first was present and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like sat brooding on the vast abyss and made it pregnant. In, in line 17 or 18, that O spirit, what, is, what does that refer to? That O spirit? Pardon? Yeah, you, oh, I don't care what Norton says. What do we say? What do we say? Oh, so, so she thinks of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, that's an obvious resonance that's going to have for us. Now, you guys probably know Baratia better than I do. Milton says, the Holy Spirit, dove light sat present, brooding, sat brooding on the vast abyss and made it pregnant. Is the Holy Spirit in Baratia? Is the Holy Spirit... Ruach Elohim Merachefet Al Oh, that's a reference to the Holy Spirit? If you're Milton, it is. So we spoke about Miltonic Christian Midrash. This is an example of it, right? That is, the Old Testament is being updated so that Ruach Elohim, which Jews understand as meaning Ruach Elohim, for Milton is the, a person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So again, Milton taking the Old Testament narrative, and through this, let's say this Midrashic method, making it, rendering it Christian. What in me is dark, illumined. Milton, of course, was blind while writing this poem. What is low, raise and support that to the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. So finally, Milton, at the end of the invocation, not after having asserted the affiliation to the Greeks, to the Jews, asserts eternal providence and says, I'm going to write another theodicy. And just going back, just to conclude our introduction to that shepherd, who is that shepherd? I mean, he can be changeable. That shepherd can be a pastoral shepherd. After all, in a Greek environment, we would expect shepherds to populate a pastoral world. And in that sense, the invocation is once again invoking a Greek antecedent. The shepherd is also obviously, as you guys said, Moses. When I get to the end in the Holy Spirit, who does the shepherd transform into? He transforms into Jesus. So like Milton's complex set of affiliations, what is he doing? He's using Greek, Hebraic, in order to write a distinctly Christian poem. So these will be four frames that we'll use as we continue to read Paradise Lost.